Oh, thank you everybody for coming this morning. Um, I was worried about the snow getting in the way, but it seems somebody had the right connection, so thank you, whoever you are. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jody Underwood. I'm the president of the School District Governance Association. Um, the, so if you don't know the organization, um, we have a number of non-members here today, as well as members, which I'm really thrilled about. Um, so the mission of the SDGA is to help school board members and budget committee members discover their powers um, to to keep school district governance transparent and accountable with a focus on educating students, and we do have a strong focus on that. Um, so again, I welcome old members. Reminder that it is a new year, and Happy New Year to everybody, and it's time to renew your membership if they didn't get you at the registration desk. Um, the, the good news is, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting up to speed technologically in this organization. Our website, our new and improved website, is going to be uh, released any day now, right, Skip? Right, Skip? Yeah, he's like, yeah, whatever, Jody. <laughs> you're on. Website, yeah. It doesn't matter, it's good. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we have online payment for both seminars and for registration. It's gonna, again, start really, really soon. So if you didn't bring money today, um, I, I will be posting soon. It'll be in the next newsletter that this is available online. Make it easy for everybody to give us money. Um, and it's not a lot of money, and we appreciate everything you do give us. Um, so I do welcome the new people here, and there are some brochures on the table about the SDGA. Please take one, and there's a membership application in there. If you like what you see today, please join us and help us do more of this. Um, and I would like to thank everybody who helped uh, put this and all the seminars that we do together. Um, and I hope I don't miss anybody. Uh, thank you to Skip for recording, to Jan and Don for registration. I believe they're still out there. Hopefully they'll come in soon. Uh, Pam for, for food, uh, although she wasn't feeling well, so she didn't stay and she brought food anyway. Um, and for food, we, we would love if you offered donations for it to help offset the costs. We really run on a shoestring budget. And um, Diane for helping with all these back end stuff, so appreciate that. Uh, and welcome back, Jorge. We are so glad to see you. So in today's seminar, so I'm gonna talk about that now, we'll do a little segue. In, so I do education research for my day job. Um, I work on technology for learning and assessment. Um, and in my circle of education researchers, people talk about teaching students 21st century skills. And I always wonder what they mean by that. Like, what is it you need to learn now that you didn't need to learn before? It's thinking, critical thinking, and so on. Um, and so, you know, is it any different from what we needed in the past? So there's new technology, but it's not always used well, and so on. So how can we train anyone for what's coming? How do we know what's coming? And they act like they know what they're talking about. So I invited our two speakers today who I know to be good and inspiring thinkers to talk to us about the future of schooling. So let me give you an introduction, well, the agenda. Here's what you're gonna to expect to see today. So first, uh, Ian Underwood will speak. Um, and I mean, we're already 9.15, we have two speakers. Uh, and we have the room until noon, so I, th I think it's gonna work out fine. So even though we're getting a little bit of a late start. After Ian speaks, um, we're gonna have a, a quick break, and then I'm gonna invite committee SDGA committee members to come up and talk about what their committees do, um, and try to take names to get involved in your particular committees. Um, then Frank Edelblue will speak, and we'll take another break after that. Um, which time I'm gonna invite other organizations who wants to make a plug for their organization that's somewhat related to school um, and, and so on. Um, in, in the meantime, we'll end, and then the third hour, whatever hour that turns out to be, um, we'll open up the floor to questions for the speakers. So during their talks, ask clarification questions. They're both more than willing to accept them. It helps engage them too, makes them more interested if they see you're interested. 
Um, but if you have any deeper questions that you want to get into, there's a pad, a blue pad on each of the tables. Grab some sheets of paper and, and write down your questions. And what I'd like to do is collect those questions and I'll choose some top ones that I think are um, a way to kick off that third hour to present to both speakers what they might want to respond to um, and then we'll open the floor to everybody um, and ask anything you want if I don't get to your question nothing personal feel free to ask it after um, and let's see so that that's my um, agenda and then just some housekeeping in case you don't know I mean I've already said help yourself to food feel free to get up and so on there are two bathrooms available uh, there one is right outside to the right of this door, and one is around the corner past that, so there are two. Um, and with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker. So, he hasn't heard this yet. So, yeah. <laughs> he's not hearing it now? And he's not hearing it now. This is normal. We're married, you know. <laughs> so, with degrees in math and the learning sciences, Ian Underwood has been a planetary scientist and artificial intelligence researcher for NASA and the director of the renowned Ask Dr. Math service, where he trained teachers and students how to think about math. He's a co-founder of Bardo Farm and Shaolin Rifle Works and is treasurer of ethics and economics education of New England. He's also a popular speaker at liberty-oriented events. Ian reads more than any 10 people I know in wide-ranging subjects, and he raises perspectives that most people have not been exposed to. Someone I know, who's in this room, has said that Ian's ideas give him a headache, but in a good way, the, the man wildly raising his hand. <laughs> you may not agree with everything he says, but I welcome you to keep an open mind, and if you don't agree with him, to challenge him. I give you Ian Underwood. Well, that's a lot to live up to. Um, so, you got it. So, I'm gonna start by talking about uh, just the future in general, right? Going back to the future. Um, and everybody knows what the future looks like because you see it in movies all the time, right? A director <laughs> can just show you something that we don't know how to do, like people flying around in jetpacks or cars or People, you know, oh, we, we hook a machine up to your eye and we suck out all your memories and put them on a disc. And we look at that and we go, hey, we don't know how to do that, but we'd like to. And so that's the future. The future is basically things that we don't know how to do yet. And some of them we'll never be able to do, perhaps, like uh, faster than light travel. Some of them, maybe we will. And to illustrate that, I mean, so, so if you want to write a fiction story, about the future, here's what you do. You just ask one of these questions. What if we were able to blank? Or what if we no longer had to blank? And then you go from there and you answer that question and you get a novel or a movie or a short story or whatever. Um, and I wanna just look at the history, the, the future. We're gonna go back in the past and look at the future of communication just very quickly because I wanna make this point. So as long as there's been language, people have been able to communicate with each other. But there were constraints, there were obstacles, right? And the future is about removing obstacles. So the obstacles were you had to be near each other, right? And you had to rely on things like memory. So I've, I tell you something and you walk away and you remember it differently, or I didn't, wasn't clear, then you get this sort of loss of meaning. And eventually we discover writing. And now, distance is less of a problem. I can communicate with somebody who's not nearby, I can communicate with people who are dead because they've written stuff that I can read. I can communicate with people who aren't yet born because I can write something down. And if I write something down and it doesn't change, then it's not so dependent on memory. I don't have people running around misquoting me or changing what I've said, right? So mutation, distance, those are less of a problem. Some obstacles have been removed and then we get movable printing, right? Where now, group size is less of a problem. It used to be like, I've got a book, I'd like to make a copy of it, I have to write it out, or hire some monks to do it, or whatever. And that's very expensive, right? And it's hard to get lots of copies, and so with movable print, suddenly, having written it, having typeset it, I can make as many copies as I physically want to. But still, okay, now I've got a bunch of copies, how do I get them to people, right? And so you don't think of ships, trains, planes, things like that as communications devices, but they really were. Because suddenly now Thomas Jefferson can go, oh, 
I heard in a letter that somebody wrote something and he can send to Paris and say, I need a copy of that, and they can bring it. Or he goes over to Ben Franklin and says, would you, you know, publish this? So, once again, at every step we're seeing obstacles removed. Things that used to be hard become easy. So then you go another step, you invent the telegraph, the telephone, where now you have communication at a distance. It's even less of a problem, and you don't really need a physical medium. I can talk to you. I can send a message without having to write it on paper or publish it or send it out. And then you get radio and television, where now there's no physical connection. I don't even have to run a cable from where I am to where you are. You can be on an island. You could be on the moon, and I can talk to you. Okay? So again, at each step, so then we get copiers, right? And copiers, you think, they you take them for granted, but there's a huge step forward there. It used to be, let's say I had a book, and I wanted you to have the book. I had to give you my book, and that I don't have it. But with copying technology, and this is back to everybody who remembers Mimeos, right, from, from their high schools, and just carbon paper, even. The fact is, now you can give somebody something and keep it, okay? And then you go to digital media, where well, that becomes even easier, and you don't have the loss, because everybody has seen a copy where somebody got something, photocopied it, and then somebody photocopied that copy, and, and that copy, and that copy, and by the end, you're like, you can barely read anything, right? Or, there, well, there's a picture of something there. I'm not, is, is that a dog? Is it a muffin? I don't know. So that goes away, and storage is less of a problem, right? If I got a, a thousand books, my house at home is full of books. And if I actually could get them in the form I really want digitally, I could live out of a suitcase, right? So that becomes less of a problem. And then we go to networks, right? Now you have instant transmission. You have instant updates where Wikipedia, right? Somebody, you find out something's wrong or something happens, somebody gets elected, somebody dies, boom, it's done in five minutes and everybody can get it. And you have continuous updates, right? And you have essentially infinite storage at this point and your location is completely irrelevant. If you want to know something, you want to find out something that doesn't, matter where you are. So, can we turn this way? Yeah, you could. Sure. Um, so what comes next, right? And thinking about the future, what comes next, whatever it is, will come from people asking those two questions, right? What if we were able to blank? And what if we no longer had to blank, right? So, what are obstacles that stand between us and things we want to do? Like, what if we were able to speak in real time to people in other languages, right? We had a babblefish we could put in our ear. What if we could do that? Well, maybe we'll be able to at some point. What if we could transmit physical objects like we do messages? And you think, well, teleportation, Star Trek, but it's like, what about 3D printing? I give you an idea and the thing shows up somewhere else, right? So those ideas, those are obstacles that may or may not be hard obstacles. Um, what if we were able to record somebody's memories, right? How much difference would that make in terms of like, right now, somebody, you live for 70 years and you've got all this stuff in your head and it's like an ice sculpture and you die and it's gone. Whatever you didn't write down or tell to somebody, well, what if that wasn't the case? What if we could actually record what people did? What if we no longer had to work? What if we no longer had to die? Okay, so those are obstacles and we can remove those and the future is about removing those obstacles. So, the thing about obstacles is, some of them are put there by the world, okay? Um, th those are things like the fact that two things can't be in the same place at the same time. Um, th or that you can't travel past certain speeds or things have mass and <laughs> it's just okay, things have mass and you have to deal with that. Um, on the other hand, th and some of those things can be made less relevant by technology, some obstacles we put in our own way. Crook TV.